a day when uh, good morning all of you and uh, on the day when Aditya is about to be launched by 11.50 today. Um, we are talking about the past missions. We are going to talk about all the three Chandrayaan missions that um, uh, uh, took off, uh, the last of which took off, uh, what, 10 days ago or so. And we will see what um, what they have achieved together. And we will look at all the three missions together. I will try and see if I can squeeze in a little bit about Aditya, because I think that's an interesting mission that is going on today at 11.50 it is to be launched and so on. So let us see what happens. So we worry about uh, Chandrayaan missions in general. Uh, India has three, well, uh, SLV-3 was the first generation log rocket launchers that we lose. Now we have two major rocket launching, um, uh, rockets through which we launch our missions. One is the PSLV mission, um, and the other one is GSLV um, Mark III. So these are the two workhorses of Indian space science. PSLV is the one that took Chandrayaan-1 and is going to now take Aditya today. <laughs> While Chandrayaan-2 and 3 went up on... Um, GSLV, modified GSLV, what is called uh, Launch Vehicle Mark III. And as you can see that um, PSLV has much smaller weight cap carrying capacity um, than, um, than um, um, LMV3, LVM3. This one can carry barely two ambassador cars. This can, can carry eight ambassador car equivalent of weight. Uh, both are um, roughly equally long. But PSLV has a 55 meter length compared to 43 meter length. It has a diameter of 2.8 meters, while uh, LMV3 is uh, 4 meters diameter. The mass is almost um, two and a half times. Uh, but um, PSLV has four stages, while PSLV uh, L L LVM has only three stages. Uh, the reason is that the third stage over here is cryogenic. So it is far more powerful, and therefore you can do in three stages itself. PSLV is entirely conventional fuel. It has solid fuel at the base, then liquid fuel, then solid fuel, and then again liquid fuel. And therefore, its weight carrying capacity is also uh, less. Um, so this is what uh, GSLV, the latest GSLV Chandrayaan, looked like. There were two booster rockets to help the lift off. This is the main rocket. Um, no single rocket can actually go very far. So typically, any so-called rocket has a multiple has multiple rockets sitting on top of each other. So in case of uh, um, G um, LMV3, there are these two boosters. Apart from that, there is stage one here, stage two in between, and then, they, then this stage three is the one that carries the payload to the place where you want it to go. So this cryogenic engine is what makes it efficient. And those who remember history, these are the engines we are supposed to get from Russia. Americans intervened and they wouldn't let us buy the technology. So Russia only sent us 10 machines and we had to learn the technology. But now we have mastered the technology of liquid um, cryogenic engines. And so we can do uh, better in terms of the weight that we can carry. In the final stage, even after all this, um, GSLV will also leave the so payload itself in near Earth orbit and this will fall back on the Earth. And this is what will go. But this has to go all the way from near Earth orbit all the way to the moon. Typically, India follows this trajectory. It has it initially puts a rocket a satellite in a very highly elliptical orbit, and every time it is close to Earth, we fire one more rocket on on the satellite itself, so that the orbit becomes even more elliptical, until it becomes so elliptical that eventually it comes to len, uh, lunar transfer orbit, where it it is captured by the moon, and then it goes around the moon. Once it reaches around the moon, we carefully slow it down so that it goes into a circular orbit, and eventually bring it down on the surface of the moon. So when you launch the uh, payload, the moon is nowhere in sight. It is calculated so that it reaches the moon at the correct point. And India has mastered this technology well. We have had three successful um, moon missions. Uh, Aditya today is also going to use same technology, except that it is not going to bother about the moon. It is going to go for much further than the moon. Um, so. This is how it happens. We initially put the, it into a circular orbit. Um, just one minute, yeah. 
So we initially put it in a circular orbit, make it more and more elliptical until it becomes so elliptical that it goes to the moon. And then as it is near the moon, this time we fire the rocket when it is at the top so that it gradually slows down and eventually comes in a circular orbit and then the final lander comes in. So this is what the lander looks like. The final orbit, for example, for Chandrayaan 3 was 100 kilometers by 30 kilometers and when it was at 30 kilometers, you fire one more engine to slow it down and bring it to the moon. And this is essentially how you reach the moon. Um, so far, 137 missions have gone to the moon. 59 failed to reach the moon. Seven were partially successful and 69 were uh, genuinely successful. Uh, 52 missions were flyby. They just looked at the moon and went further away. So uh, 68 were uh, had orbiters which went around the moon. 10 had landers or impactors. Um, which uh, landed on the moon and so on. And nine were manned missions, the Apollo series of missions. Two orbiters, um, so out of these 10, two have been orbit, uh, two orbiters, four landers and uh, four impactors and three landers have, um, landers with rovers have reached. Now we have a lander with rover. Uh, Chandra and two eventually became only a lander because the row, um, it just crashed on it and it did not succeed. And we have had, um, orbiters. Uh, there have been 10 missions, including the crash landing mission on the moon and so on. Uh, the first attempt was made on August 17, 1958. The first successful mission, the American mission at that time did not succeed. The Soviets uh, managed it uh, a year later. In September 1959, the Soviet Union managed to send a mission to moon, which was successful. Since then, um, USSR, now if you want Russia, USA, a private company in Japan, European Union, um, China, Luxembourg, and um, again in Israel, it was a private company that tried. Luxembourg has borrowed technology from elsewhere. Korea, UAE, and Russia have tried. And if you want to take uh, Soviet Union, Russia has the same thing, then they have succeeded. USA has succeeded. Uh, China has succeeded, and India has succeeded. The others na didn't manage to reach and land on the moon. Only USSR, USA, China, and India have succeeded. Chandrayaan one was launched in 2000. Sorry, Chandrayaan three was launched in uh, 2023. I beg your pardon. Okay, so these are where the missions have gone. So the whole series of Russian missions have all landed over here, and three, four of them have landed here. The Chinese mission one has landed here. Um, and uh, one has landed here and a third one has gone behind uh, the moon on the far side. As far as the um, Americans are concerned, their, their various space missions have gone to various locations and the Apollo missions have all gone over here. The thing that you notice that all of them have landed on flat planes. Um, as I will show you in a minute, uh, Chandrayaan 1, Chandra, Chandrayaan 2, 1 impactor, Chandrayaan 2 lander and Chandrayaan 3 lander were all in the poles, which you will immediately see is much more rough and much more difficult to land on. So we have chosen this difficult path because it is interesting. So ISRO uh, set the following mission objectives for Chandrayaan mission to put an orbit around the moon first, to study the topology of the moon, the surface and its structure of the moon to get a lander to land safely and softly on the surface of the moon, uh, to observe and demonstrate the technology of rover loitering capabilities on the moon. Today, ISRO has released a very nice video about the rover moving around. In situ observations of conducting experiments on material available on lunar surface and so on. We will see how far they have succeeded. So these are the three Chandrayaan missions, one in 20, uh, uh, October 2008, one on 14 July 2023, this is Chandrayaan 3. Um, Chandrayaan 2 went up uh, in 2019, Chandrayaan 1 went up in 2008. So it took us 11 years and I'll come to why it took us 11 years between these two. The primary reason is that in the second one, the rover was to come from Russia and at the last moment they backed off. Uh, then we have orbital dates. We have landing dates on November 8 when the impactor was successfully put on the surface. Um, Chandrayaan 2 land, uh, the orbiter successfully reached uh, the moon. The lander did not um, reach and we will come to why it did not reach. And of course, October Chandrayaan 3 has been all in all, all round success. Um, Chandrayaan um, 1 was originally designed to last for two years, but it lasted only for 300 days because of some technical reason. Chandrayaan 2 was supposed to last for seven and a half years. 
and the very fact that Chandrayaan 3 uses the orbiter of Chandrayaan 2 shows that this is well and truly successful. Um, it had a three year, 11 month mission, and it is still, uh, uh, it, of the seven and a half years, it, three years and 11 months have passed. It's the first orbiter and lander mission, the lander crashed. And we will come to why, like I said. Chandrayaan 3 went up in July, of course, um, August 23rd, uh, August 5th. It reached the orbit August 23 when the landing happened. The mission is still ongoing. We don't know whether we'll be extend, able to extend it beyond the 14 days. Currently, it is 14 days because the sunlight, uh, it will go into a night time. And after night time, the temperatures become really low. And we have to see whether when the sunrise comes again, whether the land um, lander and the rover can revive themselves. But as of now, we are focused on 14 days. Out of which, of course, for not for many more days have elapsed. The first lunar soft landing, which um, we successfully did in a rather difficult terrain, as we will see. The next mission is going to be what is called LUPEX. It's an Indo-Japanese collaboration sometime in 24, 26, 28 um, um, times um, year, uh, sometime between 2026 and 2028. And everything is to be determined, but it's expected to last for six months. It will be in collaboration with the Japanese. All the three missions, Chandrayaan 1's um, um, impactor, Chandrayaan 2's lander, and Chandrayaan 3's lander have all landed on the South Pole. You can see the latitude is 89 degrees, 70 degrees, and 69.3 degrees. We have focused on the South Pole. Essentially, all the focus have been in the South Pole. For those of you who are interested in the names, the impactor location was called Jawahar Point. The, the, the uh, Chandrayaan 2 was called Tiranga, and Chandrayaan 3 was um, Shakti Point, Shiv Shakti Point. So why go to the moon? I'm sorry. Why go to the moon? Uh, the reason for going to the moon south pole is that we want to, uh, th that is a region which is untouched by sunlight for billions of years. So that is one big advantage. And therefore water has remained there. So if there was any water, etc., that fell on the moon after it was formed, it would have remained safe only here. At other places, the sunlight would have ablated away the water and we would have had no water available. It is permanently in shadows and therefore I, it, Chandrayaan 1 showed that an estimated 100 million tons of water exists there. The region also has traces of hydrogen, ammonia and rare gases. These gases are things that we would normally expect them to evaporate away. But the very fact that they are available means that these regions are genuinely protected from the sunlight. So we have uh, hydrogen, ammonia, methane, sodium in particular and Chandrayaan 3 has now confirmed uh, sodium. They are all volatile materials which would evaporate away. Mercury and silver are heavy metals. They would remain there, but still it is interesting. And now Chandrayaan-3 has, has confirmed a lot more of metals. And uh, basically what happens is if you want to put a mission on moon, which can then make rockets or assemble rockets and send them to interplanetary missions, then moon seems to be a good place. And if you want to do it on the moon, water is required. And therefore, if you if you put up a station near the South Pole, then that water can be used from the moon itself to run all kinds of engines and everything, including human habitation, if you wish. And we can um, uh, go to interplanetary. So, so for future of technology development, mining, space travel, etc., South Pole is interesting because, like I said, it is 100 million tons of water. So look, let's look at Chandrayaan-1. Chandrayaan-1 was 1380 kilograms um, mission, uh, out of which... Um, what? 700 uh, kilogram was fuel and 675 kilograms reached the moon. Um, it was launched on October 8, 2022 and it reached the moon on November uh, 8. It lasted for 312 days and completed 3,400 orbits of the moon. A small 29 kg impactor um, that fell on the moon landed on November 14. The mission ended on... Uh, the mission ended on August 29, uh, 2009. Uh, it had five instruments from India and six instruments from NASA, European Space Agency, and Belgium. Um, it was a highly successful mission and provided unprecedented details of the moon. Most importantly, it for the first time established that there was water on the moon. And um, this was actually done using Impactor and, and a NASA mission at that time. So what happened was that uh, this Impactor went and... Um, so it was, drop, was dropped onto uh, one of the craters. And because of the impact, the ice um, in that crater broke and rose up. And the NASA satellite um, managed to capture it. So together, they confirmed that um, there was water on the moon. 
and then uh, data from previous missions were actually analyzed to confirm that yes, there was water on the moon. Uh, the remote sensing of the moon was done in infrared and X-rays. Uh, it prepared a three-dimensional map of the moon with a resolution of five to ten meters, uh, and it did chemical mapping of the surface, looking for magnesium, aluminium, silicon, calcium, iron, titanium, and other heavy elements, including uranium, thorium, and so on. Um, the the moon impact. This is what the satellite looked like. The, um, the mission looked like. This is where the moon impactor was, which eventually was ejected and thrown on the moon. And the other instruments were on various parts of the surface. And this was the solar panel which was used to power the satellite. Um, these are some of the images it has generated. For example, this particular uh, crater looked at from three different angles looks slightly different. And you can create one of those three-dimensional views. So if you have one of those specs with blue and uh, red filters, you will actually see the full three-dimensional image of this. Clearly, and the photograph and uh, visualization of it looks like this. So this is a two and a half dimension visualization. This is 34 kilometers across, and you can see how clearly the impact parameters can be seen. And the highest resolution would be a few tens of meters, but 34 kilometers across, and you can see how beautiful the image is. Um, it is also seen mountains again, a pure proper 3D view, and this is 600 and 600 and. Uh, 18 kilometer uh, meter high mountain, which was mapped by the um, by the moon mission, and when it was converted to proper 3D images, you see that it is 618 meters um, minus 400 meters to 618 meters. You can see the height of this mountain very clearly, and you can see the other mountain. So, uh, Mangalyan, this is another example of this time a crater where the meteor must have fallen vertically because you can clearly see the ejecta from the crater. So Chandrayaan 1 did a phenomenal job in, in identifying uh, various features on the moon. It also found interesting features like this. So that this is entirely a cave bubble on the moon. It's a tunnel, basically. It's a tunnel that goes across like this. There's an empty space here, but these tunnels are useful because in principle, if humans want to live on the moon, these kind of places will become useful. And um, 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 Chandrayaan 1 looked at various details of um, these surfaces. You can see cracks, you can create craters. This is a mineral map of the same region. So if you look at the region in white light, it looks like this. But if you look at special filters, which can look at specific elements, then it looks uh, very different. So you know this particular metal, I don't remember the metal. I think there's magnesium over here and so on. And you can see how different kind of materials are there. The craters show up clearly in light blue. So there are various impact um, areas that it studied. This is the overall map that it produced. Various metals available in the center. This time it shows very clearly. Uh, green shows the brightness of the surface measured in uh, reflected, the reflected light. Blue is water and hydroxyl, which is over here and which is over here. And red shows the iron. So you can see where the iron map of the moon is. You can see where the water is. And you can see where other elements are. So this is what Chandrayaan produced. If it had lasted for full two years, the complete map would have been available. But at least fairly large and detailed map is became available thanks to Chandrayaan. But most importantly, Chandrayaan 1 found water on the moon. And it shows the closer you go to the pole, the better the water, more the water is. And this is what is the place of greatest interest. South Pole has right, even more water than North Pole, and hence the focus on the South Pole. If you look at the surface without um, special filters, the region does not look interesting at all. It looks like any barren space of um, metal. But because Chandrayaan 1 was designed specifically to look for water, they had special filters to look at water absorption. And that is how they saw that there is water in the polar region. And there is enough water, for example, that if you take a meter cube of the soil and squeeze it, you will get about one bottle of water. That much water exists on the surface of the moon. And Chandrayaan 1 showed this, that what looked like barren to all other um, missions to the moon is actually a region full of water from which you can actually extract that water. This was the impactor that uh, was uh, put on top of the Chandrayaan mission. And it made a curved surface and eventually landed uh, latitude of 89 degrees splashed up a lot of ice, the, the, the orbit itself would have moved ahead. So it would not have seen the exact impact, which was seen by an American um, uh, orbiter, which, which came to the same place at that time and saw the results from here. And it gradually fell on the moon. 
and this data was of course uh, released by the by isro at that time what chandrayaan showed for the first time is that when material comes from the moon it actually impacts the moon there are places where the iron underneath means that there are clear uh, magnetosphere where there are small magnetic um, shells which can be used which can also be used for identifying iron uh, it shows um, detection of material from the ablation due to the fall of material from the sun it's a spluttered oxygen atoms which is surprising because oxygen on its own will not survive on the moon especially in regions which are lit by sunlight so this oxygen must have come from oxides that were broken up by the thing so there must be iron oxide and other oxides from which the iron came hydrogen which is normally not seen on the sun at all now on the moon at all would have come from solar impact so sun solar wind carries a lot of hydrogen and helium and its um, acceleration in the in the magnetosphere of the earth because moon at dark time actually is within the earth's magnetosphere so they have been able to see various movement of gases um, that initially were absorbed by the moon and eventually ejected from the moon and this is how we could see the solar wind um, interaction and that is that has provided uh, remarkable data to us about the moon so chandrayaan 1 itself was phenomenally successful chandrayaan 1's plan was to uh, look for water molecules on the surface look for uh, solar wind protons look for three make a three dimensional map of the moon uh, show evidence of volcanic uh, vents and lava ponds which in principle can be used for uh, living uh, detection of potential sites um, like buried lava tube where human habitability may be possible and it showed that there are particularly interesting um, volcan volcanic complex on moon which actually has um, some amount of water which in it, which was formed when it was born so one can actually look for the history of moon in much greater detail than we could do in the past um the end of the mission the mission ended on october 20, um, 22 2008 even though it was expected to work was, uh, sorry it was launched on october 20, 2008 it was expected to last for two years unfortunately on august 29 2000, 28 2009 we lost communication to the satellite and uh, it so it worked for about 312 days in which it was um, it mapped the moon it it was supposed to remain in orbit for about 1000 days but as much as 4 years later we when uh, when it was, when it was people tried to check the orbiters around moon the uh, chandrayaan one was still going around the moon poor fellow collecting data systematically but unable to convey it to the ground uh, isro chairman said that um, um, unusually high radiation hit the power supply uh, controlling both the computer systems on board failed because of the high radiation uh, snapping the communication connectivity there was also some questions whether the uh, power supply was overheated due to much brighter intensity of moonlight than that accounted for so somewhere uh, heating of the mission made uh, the problem uh, worse and uh, the satellite eventually stopped communicating even then i showed you the map of the moon that it has made about 95% of the surface of the moon was covered so i think we did a very good job at chandrayaan 1 then came chandrayaan 2 chandrayaan 1 was 2 was Okay, I'm assuming you can now hear me. So let us talk about Chandrayaan two. It was a follow-up mission to the Moon. Uh, it was built on the experience of Chandrayaan one. Obviously, three major changes were moved, made in the in the mission. It was taken on a heavier rocket so that it could take more weight. So GIA LMV three is a much heavier rocket, and therefore you could put more weight in the mission. It was launched on uh, July twenty nineteen, two forty three p.m. and it reached the moon on august 20 it is planned to put a lander lander on uh, september 7 and therefore the difference between the chandrayaan 1 and chandrayaan 2 was that chandrayaan 1 was orbiter and an impactor while chandrayaan um, um, 2 was supposed to put a proper um, lander on the ground and a rover was supposed to insert to experiment 14 experiments had been put on it eight on the orbiter four on the lander and two on the rover 
It was launched by um, GSLV Mark III. Uh, the spacecraft itself, like I said, against PSLV for Chandrayaan-1, which was 1.4 tons, this is 3.8 tons. It was much heavier. And um, this was the this was the uh, this was the orbiter which would went around the moon, and this was the lander that was supposed to land on moon. The Chandrayaan two mission had um, uh, an orbiter weighing two thousand three hundred kilograms, uh, a lander with one thousand four hundred kilograms, and a, a rover which was twenty seven kilograms. Then it had limited power capabilities, but it was supposed to do a very good job. The rover, of course, the orbiter, of course, worked beautifully so that even in 2023, when we launched Chandrayaan 3, the Chandrayaan 3 did not need an orbiter of its own. It used the orbiter from Chandrayaan 2 to communicate with us. And that showed how rugged the technology must have been, that it has worked perfectly even, what, three or four years down the line. Chandrayaan 2 had a configuration of, of um, orbiter, uh, rover, and lander. Uh, the mission consisted of uh, lander and rover, and the idea was to again study the topology in greater detail, mineralogy, elemental abundances, and look for uh, more detailed signature of water ice. The orbiter and lunar were supposed to get a 3D map. Orbiter was supposed to get 3D map, while the lander and the rover were supposed to explore the South Pole region. And this is what the specifications was. The orbiter had one orbit. The launch mass was 3,800 kilograms, which is typically the edge of the Indian capabilities, which is about um, 4,000 kilograms. And the combined weight drive was 1,300. The rest of it was fuel. The orbiter, 2,300 kilograms out of which 800 kilograms was the fuel. Uh, 800 gram was the actual material. The rest was fuel. And then Vikram lander also with a similar parameter. But again, like I said, I had only 28 kilograms. And the orbiter and Rover were supposed to work. It had a large X ray telescope, a solar X ray telescope. It had a dual LNS batch, have a radar for um, so lunar surface study, imaging of the moon surface in infrared, atmospheric composition of the moon. The moon has a very, very thin atmosphere. And um, Chandrayaan 2 was designed to study that, preferably in situ. Eventually, Chandrayaan 3 would do it uh, properly. There is some. And Chandrayaan um, 6, uh, the 6th mission was this uh, terrain mapping camera that was um, to go up. And then the um, radio and, and uh, anatomy of the moon and stuff like that were to be studied. So there were 7 missions to study various aspects of the moon on that. Vikram Lander had, uh, had its own force instruments which were to study moon in C2. And I will show you how in Lander, Chandrayaan 3 these things work well. Uh, Pragyan, the rover had a laser induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy to actually hit the surface so hard that the elements would sort of uh, spark and give you their signature composition. And so these were the set of instruments. Alpha particle induced X ray spectroscopy again was designed to determine elemental composition. It is interesting that uh, overall the Chandrayaan 2 payload was actually finalized in 2009. But it was rescheduled to 20, 2016 because Russia was unable to develop the lander that we needed. Eventually, um, Russian cosmic completely withdrew from, um, from the Chandrayaan-2 mission promise because their own rover to Mars had failed and they were trying to repair on those issues. I don't think they've still sent their rover. India therefore decided to, to develop the rover independently and Chandrayaan-2 um, was eventually la launched 10 years later on July 2009, and it, it was supposed to land on September 7, 2019. However, the launch was originally aborted due to helium tank leak, leak and it was rescheduled, etc. Eventually, it was launched in July 2022, 14, 22, second July, six days later. These are some of the results that we have got from Chandrayaan 2. We now, for example, have an argon fault. Now, argon is a rare element which is used in a lot of detector systems. It's a very heavy metal. But you can see that this is the map of um, the distribution of argon fault faulty on the surface of moon. And you can see that clearly moon is not homogeneous. Uh, it found daily variations in the um, argon faulty content because of evaporation and whatnot. Uh, so, and the argon 40 was originally thought to be available only on the polar. So this is the latitude and the longitude. Originally, we thought it was only in the polar region, but clearly 
even near the equator, you can see uh, argon 40. And argon 40 will have other elements along with that. So um, uh, the detector's observation of not only argon, but potassium, uh, the, the creep set of elements, potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus rich regions in the moon have all given um, more small data, including um, Aitkin terrain in uh, South Pole region also has these materials and Chandrayaan-3 would confirm that as we will show. It also observed the sun. This is a major flare on the sun, a major in increase in activity from the sun. You can see that its intensity has suddenly increased. Temperature has gone from 3 million to 7 million degrees Kelvin and then closed, closed Mayank, down I think the there is, Mayank, I yes? think there is, a, there is a problem with the slide and what you are talking. It's a mismatch. Then there's a coordination problem of the of Zoom. What, what do you see just now? Do you see Chandrayaan X-ray measurements? Yeah. Okay, so that is that is what I'm talking about. Observe the solar flare uh, occurring on the on the moon, and this is the general temperature and the density of material that is coming from the moon, while magnesium is depleted. Aluminium signal is depleted, and you can see how elemental compositions change in the particles arriving from the moon based on the solar flare. And obviously, because it hits the moon, it also hits the Earth. And therefore, we want to know exactly the composition of the kind of material that um, hits the Earth's atmosphere, because that is crucial to, for example, what Aditya will tell us. When Aditya sees such flares, now we will know, thanks to Chandrayaan 2, as to what kind of material it will carry that will come and impact the Earth's atmosphere and make changes um, as it does. This is the next slide that I have put up. It is about um, uh, uh, low bar rate scrap. So what happens is that when when um, we, uh, there, are, there are cracks like these on the surface of moon, okay? These mm -hmm. are directly associated delayed. to original. Uh, mm, this is delayed. Uh, oh, okay. So I'll be more careful. Um, so but this ah, so this yes. is a picture of some um, uh, the cracks on the surface of uh, moon and these cracks are usual because they tell you about the original history of um, the moon so this is from a very famous mare basin on the surface of the moon and these are called um, lobates uh, lobates scraps and many have been documented because we have a detailed map of the moon and these structures have been interesting because they are curved so clearly there must have been an impact over here which has created this um, this region. Somebody has complained that nothing is visible. I hope something No, no, is... it is visible. It is visible. Okay. Must be a problem with okay. your connection idea. Whoever. Okay, so you have this uh, curved uh, cracks which are which are of great interest and Chandrayaan 2 studied them in great detail. Uh, these scraps in landscape give you an idea about the moon at its birth, how it settled and how it uh, re relaxed itself, plus potential tectonic movements that must have happened when the moon was being formed and uh, effects of um, impact craters and so on. Uh, what Chandrayaan 2 did was to study these kind of regions in great detail. Even if the lander failed, the orbiter was working beautifully. So it showed exactly how the how to topology changes, how the mountain remains high and then suddenly falls back. Um, at various high, uh, at various region along the crack, which will gives you a detailed profile of these kind of cracks, and therefore tells you what how the movements must have happened. So those who map geology of planets and moons would find this very useful. The lander failed because of various analysis, uh, various results. Eventually, the failure analysis uh, committee was formed, which on uh, November 2019 made a report. It said the 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 phase one descent from 1600 kilometers meters per second to 146 meters per second uh, was proper. The first slowing down was proper. The second uh, slowing down is where the anomaly came in. And uh, after uh, about 693.8 seconds after it began its descent, so the first uh, anomaly was seen. The main engine ha had a slightly higher thrust, which means that the rocket was uh, slowing down a little um, faster than what it should have been. And because it was slowing down um, faster, uh, it had to be corrected. And unfortunately, what happened was the way the program was designed was that at the end of the phase, it would take a look at all the parameters and readjust the parameters. In that, 
they had a limited built-in safety capacity. In Chandrayaan 3, for example, this would be changed where the data would be dynamically altered. So even in that phase when it was slightly slowing down more, the thruster could have been switched on in C2 so that the slowing down does not happen. In Chandrayaan 2, the software was designed that you finish the phase and then look at the data and then decide what is to be done. In um, Chandrayaan 3, we corrected that. So obviously lessons were learned from Chandrayaan 2. So this uh, contributed to what happened was that the main, uh, to the failure, the course, threat, uh, course threat, uh, throttling of the main engines was a little faster and wrong computation of the remaining time of flight um, on, by the onboard algorithm made the rocket go down much more rapidly. Unfortunately, the landing site that had been given to the uh, lander was just 500 meters by 500 meters and therefore the rover was in a desperate hurry or the lander was in a desperate hurry to land. And therefore, it went down too fast. This 500 meters by 500 meters would be changed to two and a half kilometers by two and a half kilometers. So even if there was a small velocity anomaly, um, the lander knew it had enough space to land on. So that was one change that was made. Second change that was made was that now the parameter changes was being dynamically done in each phase of uh, landing. Subsequently, when the... Uh, Vikram landed up increasing its horizontal velocity from 48 kilometers uh, meters per second to reach the moon just two meters per second faster, higher velocity. And when it tried to do that, it landed with a thud and uh, broke. We have also now photographs of the lander mission. So this is where the impact site was. You can see the debris from the impact in green color. You can see the disturbed soil in blue color. And clearly, it landed on... Uh, uh, it scattered all over the place. It's about one kilometer. So you can get an idea. There were about two kilometers the splatter was seen. This is the picture after um, the lander Love had this. crashed and you can see the disturbance. Mm, the slide was not seen just, just a second ago. Can you repeat it please? please. Yeah, so this is the picture of the um, impact site. The impact exactly have the ma major part of the impact over here but the, the splatter because of that went more than a couple of kilometers away. So this is one kilometer. From all the way to up to three kilometers or so, we have seen the splatter and soil disturbance because of the impact of the um, of the Vikram impact. And you can see at various places, the impact, sorry, the impact happened. And on the right is the picture which is taken after the impact. And you can see that the impact genuinely affected an area of the Moon. This is a close-up, obviously. This is 100 meters. This is one kilometer. So in this close-up region, you can see the Vikram impact on the surface of uh, Moon. This is the next slide I'm showing, which keeps fluctuating between two views. And you can see how much the lander has uh, Vikram in its crash changed the surface of the Moon. So this is post-land uh, crash. This is, this is post-crash, pre-crash, post-crash. You can keep seeing that flopping pictures. And you can see how much the lander impacted the surface of moon because it crashed. Then came Chandrayaan-3. Chandrayaan-3 had a, this time did have an orbiter module. Even though this propulsion module would actually go and orbit around the moon, it had no special instruments. It had no capability to talk to the uh, lander. And it was essentially on its own. It has a small solar observer, which it can convey to Chandrayaan-2. But it had no way of talking to Chand between Chandrayaan-3 uh, and the um, orbiter module. So this would go to the moon, but remain around the moon. This lander would land. Because we had removed the uh, orbiter, we could add 200 kilograms to the lander itself, which means it allowed us to make the lander more sturdy and so on. So this was the instrument. This was the lander. It has this um, four rocket engines, Chandra uh, and two um, also had five rocket engines, which created internal confusion between various rockets. So they were reduced back to four. So there were four uh, rockets, which sort of slowed down its landing on the surface and the legs for the stabilization, which were made stronger and sturdier and various other equipment to help it land. So there was this laser Doppler velocity measure. In the worst case, it would use this, where it would send a laser beam down and see how far, how far the moon was. The laser altimeter was another additional feature that was added to make sure that the landing was safe. So there's this famous statement by the ISRO chairman saying that even if communication with and everything fails, the lander would still land safely because of these kind of additional meters measures, which made sure that the lander knew exactly where it was and how fast it was landing. Um, 
before it landed. There was also, interestingly, a hover plan this time. So for about 30 seconds in between, the lander actually stopped and hovered on the surface of the moon. And this hazard detection avoidance camera checked up very quickly if there was any piece of rock or something which might give you an uneven landing. So you don't want one of the legs to land on a rock or something and the whole thing to topple over because the surface was not flat. So this hazard detection avoidance camera held up for the mission for about 30 seconds as the mission hovered, and eventually it gave a clearance and the moon lander landed properly, Vikram landed properly. If this hazard camera had shown any piece of rock, stone or something which would create problems, the rover, the lander had enough capability so that it could move a few hundred, few hundred meters on the side and then land at another place. It was never used. It was not used. Fortunately, the ISO's other machines worked so well that none of these um, extraordinary preventive measures had to be used. The, the hazard detection avoidance camera cleared the sign location given by Chandrayaan-2 as being safe and easy to land on. And eventually, the uh, Chandrayaan-3 landed there. It had a rover um, which was deployed once the once the lander had landed and for even six, it takes about six hours for all the dust to settle. So even though this landed at about six o'clock in the evening, uh, after six hours at midnight, they released the rover which went down. And the rover went down and landed on the moon. Once it landed on the moon, its solar panel gave enough power to its various equipment inside. And that is how it started. Just to give you the basic parameters, the launch weight was... Uh, 3,900 kilograms, the payload with uh, payload mass was 2,148, out of which lander was 1,752 kgs, while Pragyan is just 26 kgs. The total weight was 3,900 at launch. And then it had various propulsion systems, various powers, etc. And uh, the, the, the original plan was uh, to, to have enough propulsion for three to six months, out of which 17 days have elapsed. Of course, now more than 17 days have elapsed and so on. It had six different instruments. So the number of instruments was reduced. It had um, Chandrayaan surface thermal measurement equipment, laser um, seismic activity measurements. It had an estimate of plasma density at various levels and so on. And all these instruments have worked very well. These two are on the rover. Um, breakdown spectroscopy meter and um, laser inter retro reflector. This retro reflector has come from um, NASA, and it will it will see it is a, it's a powerless instrument. It doesn't have any power. It simply reflects whatever radiation is thrown on it. So various other missions that are going around the moon will keep sort of um, sending signal to this reflector and study its exact location and movement over a time. So we will know whether there are movements on the surface of Mars, which will continue to happen for a long time because it's a passive detector. It requires no power. This is how the lander and the module to deliver it there separated and eventually this lander landed on the moon. This is how it landed. It started from here. It initially in the course phase turned uh, its direction. Then in a more refined phase, it simply came down on its own. Um, and then it hovered for a little while before it eventually landed on the moon. This is what it must have looked like if we could take go there and take a photograph of our lander over here and uh, of our rover over here and the lander over here. This is what the Vikram lander is. It is supposed to last for 14 days before the sunset will make the solar panels um, not produce any power and therefore the power to the system will die. And we hope that after 14 days when the sunlight comes again, it can reactivate itself, but we are not very sure because it will be really, really cold in the mid intermediate time. 1,700 kilograms of material was delivered to the moon. Uh, power was 738. Number of payloads is three. And then it had uh, these other dimensions and so on. It is supposed to last for one lunar day, which is 14 Earth days. The landing site is selected was interesting. It is The landing site is over here, way south um, uh, in the southern region, 69 degrees latitude, uh, between these two major craters, Manzian, Manzinus and uh, Simpleus. And if you look at the picture of the moon, this is what it looks like. These are the various mountains at the pole of the uh, moon. So the South Pole is somewhere here. You can see this is the South Pole. And the landing was done between these two. And now you immediately realize how dangerous it was because with impact craters, you also have mountains at the edge of the impact craters. 
So as you land, you wanted to make sure that you don't bang into one of the mountains, which is what happened to Luna 25 of Russia. And you had to gradually land and a two and a half kilometer by two and a half kilometer area seen by Chandrayaan 2 was designated as a place where Chandrayaan 3 would land. This is what the lander pictures are. This is the picture before the lander came in there. This is the picture after the lander came in there. And you can clearly see the presence of lander somewhere over here. And this is the this is a picture that came from, I think, a Russian uh, or maybe Chandrayaan 2 orbiter gave you the picture that it had landed. Uh, then the rover was released. The rover went around on its track. In this picture, you can't see the rover, interestingly, because the rover moved out. And then it came across a crater. And as it came across a crater, it turned around uh, on its own and came back to avoid falling into the crater. And there's a very nice video released by ISRO today. Unfortunately, I forgot to download it, uh, where you can see this rover going there, the wheels turning, and then the rover coming back. But this is the track of that. Chandrayaan's first measurements that were, Chandrayaan 3's first measurements that were released were the temperature. So this is the depth. This is the surface of um, the moon and this is meter depth of about 80 millimeters or 8 centimeters and this is the temperature and it goes from 60 degrees centigrade to minus 10 degrees centigrade just within 10 um, centimeters of the depth of the moon um, which is one third of a foot you can see the temperature drop drastically from um, 60 degrees centigrade when the sun was shining to minus 10 degrees centigrade just below the surface of the moon uh, these are the tracks. This is the crater that it avoided, like I said. Then, um, I think a couple of days ago, ISRO released one more uh, study where the where the device is put on the leg of the lander, Vikram itself, showed that there is iron, there is titanium, there is aluminium, there's a whole bunch of elements. So it's a sulfur, which is interesting because we would expect sulfur to evaporate in sunlight. The very fact that it saw sulfur, aluminium, calcium, iron, chromium, titanium, manganese, oxygen is another material you do not expect because it would evaporate in sun's light. But because oxidation, because of oxidation of iron or something, it must have remained there and silicon. So a whole bunch of elements were seen right on the surface, um, which shows that if you talk about landing on uh, or making a factory on moon near the South Pole, you will actually have a high abundance of these elements with you. Uh, these are the two missions which uh, measure the, this, are, this is the one that measured the thermal conductivity down to 8 millimeter or so. And this is the one that measured the composition. The seismic activity measurement is supposed to be done by this. Whether the sun has, uh, moon has um, moon quakes, etc. will be done by this. And for long term, of course, it is that passive instrument from NASA. This is what, this is the crater that it avoided. And um, it also measured the surface plasma content. So what happens is, Moon is a very, very thin atmosphere, very low density of electron plasma. And Chandrayaan-3 actually managed to measure the, um, the amount of um, atmosphere thickness and the amount of charged particles on it. This is created entirely by solar wind. So if Earth did not have an atmosphere, we would have had conditions like this. Because the Earth has an atmosphere, we are safe from it. But Moon has no atmosphere. So you can see that the electron density changes um, over time as the sunlight becomes more intense on the surface. So the bottom line is Chandrayaan-3 mission rover is expected to make uh, several important um, discoveries, composition on lunar surface. Again, water ice, it has again confirmed that it did see some water ice, but we want more data on that. The history of lunar impacts because of um, various meteors and so on. Evolution of moon's atmosphere, we saw some data on that evolution of the composition of the moon. When you go to a different location, how does the composition change? And we'll get more and more data of this. Therefore, ISRO can genuinely claim that the Chandrayaan set of uh, missions have met all the objectives that were set on it. We have landed on the southern pole. We have measured the composition on the entire surface. We have found a lot of new things. We have found a lot of metals. We have found a lot of volatile material which should not have been there. Most importantly, we have found water on it and a whole bunch of other things. So by any stretch of imagination, Chandrayaan missions have been very successful. So what did we get from Chandrayaan mission? We got the first 3D map of the moon. We established a good quantity of um, water on the moon. It provided us with detailed mineralogical map of the moon. <laughs> it showed that some of the rare metals, uh, like there is um, 
anethrotein, which is a calcium rich um, material, um, chemicals that are formed only in hot molten plasma exist on the surface of the moon. So clearly moon must have been really hot at some stage on its surface and must have cooled down in an environment where there was not much iron because you got these very odd chemicals. Most of uh, ex exciting results can be accepted um, as scientists ponder over all the data that has come in. The data does not get used up in 14 days. It takes months and years of analysis to come. So what next? Chandrayaan series has been remarkably successful. ISRO now urgently needs to make newer, heavier rockets. One of our main is that we can't fly more than 4,000 kilograms. Even um, Aditya, which is going up today, is just 2,000 kilograms. Uh, it will need better communication because we need to start worrying about deep space missions. Uh, we already have two GPS systems of our own. Apart from the American GPS system, there are two more GPS systems that India has its own. One is called Navik and one is for Gagan. One is used for aircraft maneuvering. The other is used by ships in the Indian Oceans and so on. Uh, future missions, we will require uh, more rockets. Aditya is being planned. Gaganyan is being planned. I'm not going to talk much about Gaganyan because it is still two or three years away. It will have a slightly modified version of PSLV with special protective measures and so on. But uh, Aditya, I want to look at because it goes on today. And then other planetary missions are being planned. We want to go to um, Shukra and so on, uh, Venus and so on. Aditya is an interesting mission because it is at L1 point. Now, L1 point is a place where the gravity of the sun uh, and the earth plus the angular momentum of the or any object that is sitting there is such that that object will go around the sun once in 365 days, exactly like the earth does. So with respect to earth, it is stationary and it can see the sun all the time. It does not worry about eclipsing or so on. And because it is at a constant distance, there is no question of having to correct everything for distance and so on. Um, so far, seven or eight missions have gone to this L1 point. Uh, three are currently active. But the last of this, the most latest of these was about six or seven years old. Since then, technologies have changed, human capabilities have changed, our ability to understand things have changed. And so Chandra um, um, uh, Aditya will be in the first what we hope will be a series of missions to study the sun at L1 point. Yeah. After eight years, another mission is being sent to L1 point to study the sun all the time. It will study a lot of things. It will study the upper atmosphere of the sun. It will study the chromosphere, that is. So the upper atmosphere is chromosphere and corona. It will study how the atmosphere is hot, how it is heated, how the particle, charged particles are released from the sun, what is solar wind, how does it come, etc. So it has four detectors in a wavelength, in electromagnetic radiation. It will look at the sun in optical light, UV light, and two X-ray bands. And it has three instruments which will measure the plasma characteristics of the solar wind. So it will measure low energy particle flux and movement. It will measure high energy particle flux and movement. And it will measure the magnetic field in the solar wind. So it will measure and when you correlate with the two, you will get an idea about how plasma is released on the surface of the sun from coronal holes and stuff like that. And it will give you the plasma environment and provide data on the particles from the sun. So it has a fairly long uh, detailed ambition. And it hopes to be able to work as an early warning system to satellites because we are all now dependent on satellites for communication and satellite communication can be seriously hampered if the sun sends out a major flare or something. It's called the space weather. So space weather studies are the primary objective of um, Aditya and it, it hopes to continue to monitor the sun and give us an early warning about things that can potentially go wrong in case the sun um, erupts in a violent way and things like that. Aditya 2 will be in the inner Lagrangian point, like I said. Um, it will take 100 days for it to reach the L1 point. Again, the same um, orbiting maneuvers will be used where it will go around the Earth multiple times before it is extended and thrown away from the Earth. And then once it is removed from the Earth's gravity, it will essentially work. The Sun's gravity will be the dominant force and it will gradually turn and come down to L1 point and it will remain at L1 point, study the movement of the sun. Travel time is about four months. It will take a hundred plus days to reach there. It has four remote sensing payloads. We will look at the sun in visible, ultraviolet and soft X-ray light. And it is in ultraviolet that its imager will be unparalleled to all the others that have been sent. And that is where it will make a unique contribution. Other detectors that are there, like I said, there are three other missions at L1 point. But this will be highly, this will be the have the most um, modern of technology, latest of technologies, 
then therefore should provide some interesting results. Uh, there are three measurements of particles movements from the sun, like I said, and four of observing the sun in, infra in electromagnetic radiation. I have said this, so I will not say it again. It's the first time that a specially resolved uh, solar disk you know, image will be available in UV band. And it will be able to correlate solar um, um, dynamics of how the solar flares happen and so on. And onboard intelligence will detect material that will come to the earth. Itself. So it has been given some amount of um, intelligence to do that. And therefore, it will be able to tell us about what is happening on the sun. I'm going to skip this slide. It simply says what are the mission objectives, how the L1 point is reached. This is the L1 point between the earth and the sun. And this is where the satellite will be at. It will be parked so that the effective gravitational potential and its own angular momentum balance everything out. And it will go around the earth, uh, go around the sun along with us. So it will be geostationary in some sense of the word. Uh, then comes Gaganyan, where we want to send much heavier weight. Now we want to send 8,000 kilograms. So it is double the current weight carrying capacity of our rockets, which will have to be increased. The dry mass will be still 3,700 kilos. Aditya, for example, is just 2,000 kilos and Chandrayaan was 4,000 kilos. And it will also have to have safety modules for uh, crew safety and so on sitting on top. And it will have a much more powerful rocket. So essentially, the rocket will be launched. Once it is launched, it will release a capsule in which the uh, three astronauts will sit. It will go around the sun for um, seven day, five to seven days. And then it will be brought back by parachute on Earth. We have already done these kind of experiments without uh, humans in it. So the return capsule, etc., have been tested uh, some time back. And slowly, gradually, the experience is being built about how to send human beings safely to space and bring them back. The launch date, like I said, is somewhere in 2025, so year, at least a couple of years from now. As a responsible space agency, now that we are in the, in the higher rungs of the thing, we have to worry about our international responsibilities. All these rockets going on up in the space have created a lot of dust. So, for example, in some sense, Moon has become the new junkyard where all, all the Chandrayaan missions and all the lunar missions and all the missions are simply lying there. When the instruments die, they simply become, they remain there without any way of cleaning up the Moon. So, we have to have, but the near Earth space is the worst. What I have here is the altitude from the ground. So, zero kilometers to zero meters to thousand, sorry, zero kilometers to thousand kilometers and the amount of dust of various sizes that exists. And you can see a huge amount of dust particles being collected. 111,000 objects going around the Earth at 80 kilometers a second. They are a hazard to other satellites, they are a hazard to other rockets and other missions. And we need to do something about that. So ISRO will have to start planning on that. So apart from building rockets for its own use, for more powerful rockets, it must also start uh, worrying about with international agencies about how to get rid of this dust. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you very much, Mayank. It was wonderful, as always. I should not be saying thank you. this. Thank you, thank you. So if you, I'm stopping my sharing. If you have any questions, you can ask. Sir, I think there yeah, are some uh, questions in the chat box as well. Yeah. OK. Can somebody <laughs> read them? Yeah. 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 You can read them. Unmute and. Come on. Uh, so, uh, so there's a question from some, somebody called Salil. Uh, Salil, on Earth, the height of a mountain is measured with respect to the sea level. On the moon, yes. there is no sea. How is the height of a moon uh, of a mountain on the moon measured? So, with respect to the flat ground average, so you take um, what you do is you take a sensor from the Earth and you measure the height of the various surface areas from that satellite. So based on that, you get an average idea of what is the flat surface um, distance from the satellite. Based on that, you measure the height of the different mountains uh, with respect to this flat surface. Water essentially simply provides a flat surface for reference. On the moon, the various uh, large seas, empty seas, no water, but still the seas, provide the reference frame. Hmm. Uh, Professor, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, this is Sri Ram. Uh, I have two yes. things. One is, uh, it is said that there are a lot of asteroids uh, on the moon that cause craters. 
have these uh, missions found any uh, uh, asteroid tracking while uh, they are monitoring it? Not while, in the sense that there have been a lot of... Um, so there are people who continuously observe the moon simply for seeing if there is a new impact crater. But none was seen while this seven. It is now no longer that frequent. It happens once in a few years now. Okay. It is not a, okay. Now it is no longer a very frequent event. Okay. See, if you remember, NASA periodically gives you an announcement saying an asteroid will pass by the Earth with such and such a distance. And typically those kind of announcements come once every two, three years. And yes. moon is even Correct. smaller. So the impacts are typically one few decade, once in a few decades or so. Okay. And second suggestion, doctor, is uh, that uh, can you get the slides proofreaded? Because in one year, said the rover is 27 kilo, uh, kg. And in one year, said the uh, uh, rover is 26 kg. Uh, so if it is... I have, I have used this day, yeah. So, so I have used this data someone? directly from ISRO. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, go on, go on. 27 and 26? One kg difference. So maybe they have... Um, I don't know which level who made the mistake. Okay. But my personal Thank feeling you. is that it is 27 kg. And I'm and sorry for the error. What is the wet weight and yeah, drive? Exactly. Yeah. My no, that but... is not just one kilo. So the uh, uh, rover is entirely dry weight. It has no fuel and it has no power clearing capacity except by the except for the solar panels. So yeah, everything is dry weight on the rover. So it's just a typing error somewhere. One kilogram is a typing error. Could it also be reagents and things like that it's using as part of its payload Possibly. to conduct experiments? Possibly. Which Possibly. Are dispensable then. It is possible. It is more than possible, in fact. Lovely lecture, Mank, as usual. Of course, Thank fabulous. You. Thank no, you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm how, happy that you attended. Yes. Uh, tell me something. How how many times do you think we need to test the Gaganian vehicle? I mean, if you bring a new oh. vehicle in, our present vehicle is time tried and tested. It's solid. Yes. Okay. The thing that has been tried was 500 kilograms. Um, what we need to bring down is more than a thousand kilograms. Um, more than a thousand kilograms has to come back. That is one issue. Second issue, we need to test the parachute, etc. That can take a thousand kilogram weight and slow it down in the atmosphere. Um, for example, when um, when Americans were going to the moon, they actually had Apollo 10 mission, which landed and left the moon uh, without any human being. And Apollo 11 was simply an identical copy of Apollo 10. So you do that. So the, the blind lander was tested. Now we have to test it with a full 1000 kilogram weight with um, dummy humans and whether the parachutes that we are designing will hold up on that or not. And then eventually uh, bring it down. So for example, when Yuri Gagarin went up, he was originally supposed to go for seven days. Then the Russians panicked and made it three days and eventually brought him down in two days or something. Okay. So there's always that nervousness of first time. So you think there will be eight or ten attempts before we actually put somebody on? The yes, board? yeah, I would guess so. I would guess so. Yes. Uh, so and there is a booster. So. Are we designing our own booster or uh, we have to enhance booster? Have to. Rocket technology can be used for missiles, so nobody gives you. Okay, this is class. This is dual use technology. So, so it's a brand really new close, like America, Japan got a lot of these rocket technology from America because America allow is allowed to export a dual use technology to Japan. Until recently, we were banned from uh, importing dual use technology. So we had to so cryogenic engines, for example, are entirely Indian. The Russians just won't sell us the technology even after signing a memorandum to sell it to us, and they just gave us ten engines, uh, which were then retrofitted to see what the technology was and replicated in India. But uh, what that about what this is. That new is booster? What kind of uh, what kind of power does it need to generate? This Gaganya oh, booster. I don't really have the numbers, but thousand kilograms or four thousand kilograms have to go to eleven kilometers per second to escape the Earth. Okay, and we can't do it. So currently, what we do is we give them an elliptical orbit, typically about few hundred, uh, must be about eighty hundred kilometers per second, and then keep on boosting them every time they are close to us and do that. So we we don't so for example even though we say we are the fourth the distance between the third and the fourth is la quite large so Chinese have a space station a routine manned program um, moon um, sample recovery missions they have done they have been to L one 
uh, and they have a running process space station. We need first a rocket. We have that plans for a space thousand kilograms now. We have first. We don't have a rocket. We need to be able. Our own communication satellites are launched by other space agencies because we don't have a rocket hard enough. So first, we need a heavy rocket. That is why Chandra Gaganyan is delayed because we need to send a capsule that is at least eight thousand kilograms. The heaviest that wow. we can do, Chandrayaan, was just four thousand kilograms. So we need so the eight thousand kilogram energy. capsule basically to double the weight to make sure the safeguards uh, and uh, uh, double weight. the load carrying capacity. So the Engines and everything to have to be so much more powerful. Wow, amazing! And that that is now going Thank to be our next focus, because sending three thousand, four thousand kilograms to Shukraya to Ma, Ma, Venus or something will be fun, but to do serious, in, uh, for example, um, interplanetary missions is just one part of space. The bigger part of the space is that there are a lot of chemicals, giant sensitive molecules, etc., which you cannot make on Earth because of Earth's gravity. So you need to make them in space. So already drugs are available, which are so delicate that they cost tens of thousands of rupees per milligram because they are made in space. So at some stage, even in near Earth orbit, you're going to have to put up factories. And to put up a factory, you need to be able to at least transport several tens of thousands of kilograms or several tons of material and make a space station in the space. And if you want to get into that game and we have to get into that game, we need more powerful rockets. But so the part of space is going to be a making uh, factories in near Earth space, two setting up stage for um, um, at least robotic inhabitation of the moon and exploitation of the moon, either to bring material back or to at least make rockets for uh, interplanetary missions, and then other rare materials whether you can get it from meteorites and stuff like that. And the last is of course that nobody nobody should do to us what it did to dinosaurs, which is just a twenty kilometer um, meteor killed everybody on Earth. So that is another big mission. That's why NASA last year did that mission where they pushed a meteor out of its regular orbit just to make sure that we understand that technology. But we do need to understand this technology and we need to help clear up the space junk because we are also producing a lot of space junk. Mayank, this is a topic for another separate lecture. Yes, that is true. <laughs> Thank you, Mayank. That is a, my pleasure. My uh, pleasure. Hi, Mayank, sir. Hi. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank, thank you for your detailed presentation. I really appreciate My it. Pleasure. Uh, I had a doubt regarding the Pragyan rover. Uh, yes. The doubt was that do you have remote access to the rover from the Earth or is it completely making decisions based on uh, machine learning or AI algorithm that is being used? So what happens is that um, it takes about a second for the signal from Earth to reach Moon. Then okay. on the moon, it, ha it has to go through this uh, Chandrayaan 2, then the lander, though of course we have capability of directly talking to the lander also, or to Vikram, but Vikram mm -hmm. talks to uh, the rover. We don't talk to the rover. Vikram talks to the rover. Oh. So, so Vikram tells us what rover is doing. Fine. Sorry? Uh, so when it's navigating its way through, uh, for example... Yeah, so it I has saw... some onboard intelligence. Okay. It depends okay. a lot on its onboard intelligence. Uh, but it in principle is capable of talking to the earth and the earth is capable of telling it what to do and what not to do. But so for example, the famous example of um, avoiding the crater, it probably mm -hmm. sensed an uneven surface and turned around. Yes. So there was this video that was being released by ISRO. Very nice. I could see a crater that was nearby the Pragyan rover. And I think it, uh, it avoided that crater somehow. So I, just, so I was just curious how that was being done. Was it completely done by the rover itself or was there any remote access? It was completely done by rover itself. It was not okay. that it was dynamically being advised. It would have probably okay. been given to activate, uh, um, uh, command to activate the avoid, uh, avoid uh, the, uh, the yeah, crater. The crater. And, and then the, the program on how to avoid the crater must have been internal. Okay. And uh, as a fellow data scientist student, I was curious about uh -huh. what machine learning algorithm was used. Can you give me some certain details regarding that? Uh, first of all, I'm not an authority. I don't work with this and I've not worked on the Chandrayaan okay. missions. But a okay. lot of things go on. For example, um, even measuring your hello, uh, it, it is good to say that it was moving at 1700 meters per second, etc. In mm -hmm. space, there are uh -huh. no roads and therefore there are no speedometers. The okay. way the measurement is done is with respect to distant stars and once you reach the surface of the moon, with respect to the surface of the moon itself. Okay. 
So those Thank kind you. of massive image processing data goes on. Okay. How do you think it could wake out, for example, whether there was a hurdle when it was hovering? In 30 seconds, it had to take an image, look for uneven shapes, mm -hmm. look for uh, potential shadows of those uneven shapes or possible mm -hmm. um, uh, difference in height, etc., using laser interferometer to see if there is a boulder along on your way. All that mm -hmm. requires massive image processing and a very high speed. And remember Let's that see. you can't put uh, the latest uh, internet chip, uh, your latest computer chip on it because this mm -hmm. internet in, uh, interplanetary environment is so heavy in radiation that you need mm -hmm. special radiation hardened chips which have a certain amount of pedigree and testing, etc. So typically the computers in space are about a generation or two behind the computer that you use on the ground. Okay. Because they have to be tested for space environment. They have to be made for and tested for space environment. And that's a very okay. long process. So it is taking so, inputs as images and doing image processing and then predicting yes, whether yes. it's hazardous or not. Okay. Correct, correct. And the entire thing is image processing and communication. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Uh, this is a question for institution. Uh, yes. Is this video going to be uh, uploaded on YouTube? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, and the link will be shared, right? Oh, well, you'll have to look for it. If you're part okay. of Institution, yes, Sridhar, if is it you yes, speaking? Yes, I am. Ah, yes, then you yes, will definitely, definitely find a link. Okay, thank you. It will be thank given you. through the Institution website also. Okay. So, I can share it with others. Please make interest. it a habit of visiting the website regularly. I will, I will. <laughs> yes. Yeah? Okay, thank you, sir. Purush sir, you are on mute. Srirang Institution has its own channel on YouTube. So if you go to the channel, you'll see it in the latest videos in a couple of days. Okay, thank you. Perhaps we can take one last question, which was on the chat, sir. It says, yes. what significance of presence of sulfur on the moon? Um, well, there are two, three things. Sulfur is very volatile. That is one issue. Second thing is sulfur is also a very useful material to have. Uh, so we want to know if sulfur is that it is useful. Also, it also it tells you that that part of the surface of moon was never really heated. Once it settled down and sulfur fell, probably sulfur came from outside from meteor impact or something. But once it came there, it has remained there. And that is a useful um, information to have. Oxygen, sulfur, etc. tend to evaporate very quickly. They are volatile materials. So that is where the sulfur comes in. Uh, does also anybody sulfur is chemical as well? Yeah. Sorry, uh, does... no. If anybody any else has any questions, no. I think uh, we can wind up here. Thank you so much, Dr. Varya, for a wonderful, wonderful, Thank insightful you. talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all for joining in. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.